Now we come to the chapter of the twos. Eh? We have finished with the chapter of the ones. Eh? Uh, Anguttara Nikaya, chapter of the twos. Eh? Dukkha Nipata. 2.1.2 The Buddha said, Monks, these two struggles are hard to undergo in the world. What two? The struggle of householders who live at home to provide clothing, food, lodging, medicines for the sick and provision of necessities and the struggle of those who have gone forth from home to the homeless to renounce all basis of rebirth. These are the two struggles. Of these two monks, the latter is the more important. Wherefore I say unto you, thus must you train yourselves. We will undertake the struggle to renounce all substrates of rebirth or all basis of rebirth. That is how you must train yourself, monks. So the Buddha says, uh, that's the end of the sutta. The Buddha is saying that the struggle of householders uh, is to provide the necessities for the home. Uh, and the struggle uh, of monks uh, is to renounce the sub- supports uh, or the basis of rebirth. Uh, and the struggle of monks uh, is the more important Sometimes we find uh, a lot of people, they go through life struggling, uh, one thing after another. When they're young, a lot of people, they uh, struggle to get a good education, and after that, they want to get a good job. After that, they want a good marriage partner, and after that, they want children. Uh, One thing after another, they want then a car and a house and grandchildren later, etc., and then... At the end of it all, uh, a lot of people, when they are about to die, uh, they are very confused, they, they are very disappointed, and then they wonder what life is all about. Uh, all the things that they wanted, uh, they struggle for, uh, most of it they have attained, and suddenly they find that they have to lose all of it. Uh, so we keep on coming back again and again to do this kind of struggle, but the Buddha said the struggle to end the cycle of rebirth is far more important. And then the next sutta is 2.1.3. Monks, there are these two things that burn. What two? Herein a certain one has done immoral acts of body. He has done immoral acts in speech and thought. He has omitted moral acts in body, speech and thought. He is burned or seared, with remorse at the thought, I have done wrong in body, speech, and thought. I have left undone the good deeds in body, speech, and thought. And he burns at the thought of it. These monks are the two things that burn. So, the Buddha says, eh, if we uh, have done immoral acts, eh, immoral karma in body, speech, and mind, eh, or we have omitted to do moral acts, eh, uh, moral karma, wholesome karma in body, speech, and thought, then uh, our conscience is pricked. Uh, so you see, uh, sometimes it's not only uh, that we do something immoral. You know, Even if we fail to do something that we ought to do uh, later, uh, it will burn our conscience and we get pricked by it. Uh. That's why uh, we have to be careful. What are the immoral acts? For example, uh, immoral act of body uh, might be killing, committing adultery, or stealing. And immoral acts of uh, speech uh, might be lying, slandering, carrying tales so that people quarrel, uh, etc. And then uh, immoral act of uh, thought uh, might be having uh, hatred uh, for somebody, uh, etc. Mm. Now the next sutta is 2.1.5. The Buddha said, Two things, monks, have I realized. To be discontented in good states and not to shrink back from the struggle. Without shrinking back, monks, I struggle on thus. Gladly would I have skin and sinews and bones wither and my body's flesh and blood dry up if only I may hold out until I win what may be won by human strength by human energy, by human striving. By my earnest endeavor, monks, I won enlightenment. I won the unrivaled freedom from the bond. And you too, monks, 
do not you decline the fight, but struggle on, saying to yourselves, Gladly would I have my skin and sinews and bones wither, and my body's flesh and blood dry up. If only I may hold out until I win what may be won by human strength, by human energy, by human striving. Then you two monks, in no long time, shall win that goal for which the clansmen rightly leave home for the homeless life, even that unrivaled goal of righteous living, realizing it for yourselves even in this very life, and having reached it, you shall abide therein. Wherefore I say unto you, monks, thus must you train yourselves. We will not decline the fight, but will struggle on with this thought. Let skin and sinews and bones wither, etc., etc. That is how you must train yourselves, monks. That's the end of the sutta. There's a sutta in the Majima Nikaya, I think number 12, where the Buddha described uh, the struggle that he underwent, uh, the six years, uh, the various types of suffering he underwent. And uh, it was quite uh, moving to read uh, the way the Buddha struggled. And the Buddha said uh, that uh, nobody uh, in the past uh, uh, could have um, suffered more than him uh, on the spiritual path. And in the future, the Buddha said nobody also uh, could possibly suffer more than him on the spiritual path. At the very most, they could only equal the amount of suffering he went through. So you see that uh, our teacher uh, is somebody uh, who exerted himself and, uh, and the Buddha, that's why, also encourages uh, to put in a lot of effort. Uh, and um, how much effort we put in uh, uh, would uh, determine uh, how much we get out of the spiritual path. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, it is concerned with letting go. Letting go. The spiritual path is concerned with letting go of the ego. Letting go with our likes and dislikes. Uh, uh, our opinions and etc. And anything to do with the ego. That's why it's very important to always uh, observe our mind. If a person is a meditator, he should always be observing his mind, see the ego working. The next sutta is 2.1.6. Buddha said, Monks, there are these two things. What two? Looking with satisfaction on things which are fetters that bind to rebirth, and looking with disgust thereon. Monks, he who dwells looking with satisfaction on things that bind like fetters, abandons not greed, abandons not hatred, abandons not delusion. He who abandons not these is not released from rebirth, from old age, from sickness, from death, sorrow and grief, woe, lamentation and despair. He is not released from dukkha, ill, I say. But monks, he who dwells looking with disgust on things which are fetters that bind, abandons greed, hatred, and delusion. Abandoning these, he is released from old age and decay, etc. He is released from dukkha, I declare. These monks are the two things. That's the end of the sutta. So the Buddha is saying that there are certain things huh, which are fetters, huh, attachments, huh, attachments, to our relatives, attachments to our property, our wealth. These are the two greatest attachments. The Dhammapada, the Buddha said, uh, the chains, uh, iron chains, uh, uh, that bind a person uh, are nothing uh, compared to the bonds uh, that are created from family ties, from worldly ties, uh, 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 ties of a close family, ties of our property, etc. Those are real bonds. Uh, so, uh, a person who is uh, not uh, learned in the Dhamma, uh, those things that are fetters uh, to, to that person, uh, that means those things uh, are, uh, are things that bind him to the wheel of samsara, uh, he looks with satisfaction on them. Uh, he's very happy and satisfied uh, that he's got a big house, got a lot of money in the bank, uh, he's got uh, very beautiful children, uh, 
uh, very loving husband or very loving wife, etc. Uh, those things uh, that uh, to a worldly person uh, are things that give him joy and happiness uh, are those very things uh, that bind us to samsara. That is why uh, it is very difficult uh, to walk the path, the spiritual path. Most people, uh, those, they want to enjoy those things uh, because it's very normal for, for uh, 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 worldly people, uh, for normal human beings uh, to enjoy things uh, like, like that, uh, having a loving husband, loving wife, loving children, etc., and they get a lot of joy and satisfaction, uh, enjoying good music, uh, uh, a, a nice TV set, uh, what uh, Astro TV and all that. But those are the very things uh, that uh, bring us back to rebirth. Uh. So the Buddha says, uh, if we have the wisdom of the Dhamma, uh, from listening to the Dhamma, then we know that these are the things uh, uh uh, that that bring us back to rebirth. Uh. That's why the the Buddha says in the Dhammapada that the worldly path uh, is in one direction, the path to nibbana is in the opposite direction. Uh, it's, uh, uh, some people uh, they 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 think they want to get the best of both worlds. They want to put one foot in one boat and one foot in the other boat. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, if you make any progress after some time. Uh, you realize that if you really want to cultivate, you have to renounce. If you don't renounce, eh, it's uh, very difficult to practice. 2.1.9, the Buddha said, Monks, these two bright states protect the world. What two? Sense of shame and fear of blame. Hiri otapala, which probably can be better translated eh, as conscience and remorse. Eh. And then Buddha continues, Monks, if these two states did not protect the world, then there would be seen no mother or mother's sister, no uncle's wife, nor teacher's wife, nor wife of honorable men. But the world would come to confusion. Promiscuity such as exists among goats and sheep, fowls and swine, dogs and jackals. But Monks, since these two bright states do protect the world, therefore there are seen Mothers and mothers, sisters, uncles and uncles, wife, teachers, wife, etc., etc. That's the end of the sutta. So the Buddha is saying uh, that because we have a sense of conscience and remorse, uh, uh, conscience meaning like uh, uh, the fear to do something wrong, and remorse meaning that... Uh, uh, to grieve, to, to feel remorse uh, over some wrong that you have done. People without a sense of remorse, uh, they do something wrong and they don't feel the conscience pricking them. Uh, maybe their conscience does prick them, but they just uh, keep on doing doing the, the, the wrong things until, how can I say, uh, it doesn't uh, pain them anymore. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so a person... Uh, with remorse and conscience, uh, he would not uh, do things that animals do. Uh, the Buddha is saying, talking here about promiscuity, you, you see uh, animals, uh, uh, they don't recognize a mother and uh, and uh, uh, son or daughter, etc. They just uh, uh, are very prom promiscuous. Uh. So human beings don't do that. But sometimes you find human, some human beings do that. Uh. Especially nowadays, uh, you read in the papers, there's a lot of uh, cases of incest, etc. So if we behave like animals, then it's very likely uh, that ne next time we come back to rebirth, we'll be have an animal rebirth. Uh, if we behave like devas, then it's very likely that we will have rebirth in the deva realm. 2.2.9 2 The Buddha said, Monks, if in any dispute the offending monk and the reproving monk do not practice strict self-examination, it may be expected that it will conduce to protracted, bitter, contentious strife, and the monks will be unable to live at ease. But when in any dispute both the offending monk and the reproving monk do practice strict self-examination, it may be expected that it will not conduce 
to protracted, bitter, contentious strife, and that the monks will be able to live at ease. And how do the two parties practice strict self-examination? Herein the offending monk reflects thus, I have fallen into some bodily offence. Now, the other monk saw some particular occasion of bodily offence into which I had fallen. Had I not so offended, he could not have seen it. Since I so offended, he saw it. Seeing it, he was annoyed. Being annoyed thereat, he gave utterance to his annoyance. Thus rebuked by him, in his annoyance I also was annoyed, and told others of my annoyance. So herein my fault overcame me, as in the case of one who has to pay duty on his goods. That is how the offending monk practices strict self-examination. And how monks does the reproving monk do likewise? Herein the reproving monk thus reflects, This monk has fallen into some bodily offence. Indeed, I saw this monk so falling into offence. Had he not done so, I should not have seen him so doing. As he did so, I saw him so doing. At the sight of this, I was displeased thereat. Being displeased, I expressed my displeasure to this monk. Thus annoyed by my expression of annoyance, this monk told others of his annoyance. So herein my fault overcame me, as in the case of one who has to pay duty on his goods. That is how the reproving monk practices strict self-examination. Now if both the offending and reproving monk do not practice strict self-examination, it may be expected that it will conduce to protracted, bitter, contentious strife, and the monks will be unable to live at ease. But if, on the contrary, they do practice strict self-examination, it may be expected that the opposite will happen. That's the end of the sutta. Uh, this sutta is more for monks, but it is equally applicable to lay people. Sometimes you find two parties uh, quarreling, eh? And the Buddha is saying that uh, if we are involved in any quarrel or in any uh, ill feeling with somebody else, uh, we have to examine ourselves and be frank and see our faults. uh, uh, And uh, uh, if we practice self-examination and uh, admit our our faults, uh, then uh, we can apologize or at least even if we don't apologize we don't make matters worse eh, by prolonging the dispute or whatever 2.2.7 the brahmin janusoni came to visit the exalted one and after paying respect etc sat down at one side so seated he said to the exalted one pray master gotama what is the reason what is the cause why some Beings here in this world, when body breaks up after death, are reborn in the waste, the woeful plains, the downfall, in hell. The Buddha said, owing to commission and omission, Brahmin. And then Janusoni asked again, But pray, Master Gotama, why are they reborn when body breaks up after death in the happy lot in the heaven world? Again, the Buddha said, owing to commission and omission, Brahmin. And Janusoni said, I do not understand the detailed meaning of what has been concisely stated by the worthy Gautama, but not explained in detail. It would be well for me if the worthy Gautama would teach me Dhamma in such a way that I might understand his meaning in detail. Then the Buddha said, Then Brahmin, do you listen? Give careful attention and I will speak. Very good, sir, replied the Brahmin Janusoni to the Exalted One. The Exalted One said, Now in this connection, Brahmin, certain beings have committed immoral acts of body, speech and thought. They have omitted moral acts of body, speech and thought. Thus, Brahmin, it is owing to commission and omission that beings are reborn in the waste, the woeful plains, the downfall in hell. Again, Brahmin, certain beings have committed moral acts of body, speech and thought. They have omitted immoral acts of body, speech and thought. Thus again, it is owing to commission and omission that beings after death are reborn in the heaven world. Excellent Master Gautama, excellent Master Gautama, etc., etc. And then uh, in the Brahmin took refuge in the Buddha. So here this Sutta again uh, is about karma. 
the Buddha again is saying uh, that uh, karma has two parts of it, uh, that uh, uh, the doing of something and uh, neglecting to do something. So just like I explained just now, uh, both we have to look after. Just like, for example, if we uh, uh, create uh, good karma towards our parents, uh, uh, that is uh, that is good karma. But because our parents have done a lot for us, so if we neglect to look after our parents, uh, uh, and that again is uh, very bad karma. Now we'll come to another sutta, which uh, is a previous sutta, which I missed out the last time. It is 2.3.9. The Buddha said, Monks, it is because I observe these two results therein that I am given to dwelling in lonely spots, in solitary lodging in the forest. What to observing my own pleasant way of living in this very life and feeling compassion for future generations. These are the two results. That's the end of the sutta. Here the Buddha is saying uh, that he likes to live in secluded places, live alone in the forests or caves, etc. For two reasons. One is um, his own uh, pleasant way of living. That means uh, he has a pleasant abiding uh, for himself. Because when, when a monk stays alone, uh, there is nobody to disturb him. And uh, he is very free to do what he likes. Uh, and especially if a monk is good in meditation, he can uh, just spend his time in meditation, uh, which gives him a lot of bliss la, and a lot of uh, advan- uh, advantage la, in the spiritual life because the Buddha said that uh, uh, the cultivation of the jhanas uh, will uh, give you four advantages, la, uh, cultivation of the mind, uh, cultivation of uh, Samadhi, uh, concentration, uh, give you four advantages, namely the four fruits of Aryahood, uh, Sotapana, Sakatagami, Anagami, and Arahanhood. This is mentioned, I think, in the Diga Nikaya. And um, he also said somewhere, I think in the Sutta or in the Vinaya, he says, when he lives alone uh, in the forest, uh, then uh, he can uh, he's, he feels so free uh, that even when he wants to answer the calls of nature he doesn't have to look around to see whether anybody is uh, around and the second reason is feeling compassion for future generations uh, this is because of compassion uh, for future generations uh, he is showing the way for monks uh, in other words encouraging monks uh, to stay in secluded places uh, to cultivate themselves and he also always encourage monks uh, to practice alone, stay in secluded places and practice alone. But of course not all monks can do it unless you come to that stage where you can live alone. Uh, uh, if you go and try to live alone when you're not ready, it can uh, have a negative effect instead of a positive. Uh. Mm. The other thing I like to mention here concerning this sutta is in the uh, Mahayana teachings, uh, there is a little bit of contradiction also concerning this one because in the Mahayana Bodhisattva precepts, one of the minor Bodhisattva precepts is that a Bodhisattva is not is is not allowed or forbidden uh, to stay alone in the uh, quiet place Aranya a secluded place, he's not uh, allowed, uh, according to the Bodhisattva precept, uh, to stay alone. Whereas uh, here, even the Buddha is already enlightened, and yet he likes to stay alone. And he also encourages his disciples who are not enlightened yet uh, uh, to also dwell alone to cultivate themselves. The other person who is famous for staying alone is uh, Mahakasapa the uh, very ascetic monk, disciple of the Buddha. 